we are going to get moving along. We've got four modules that we're going to present today that's going to take you in sequence from more of a theoretical overview of the approach on through doing assessment in a TCP oriented sort of way and then doing the narrative summary and the revised treatment plan form uh, and all of the processes that come along with that. So I'm going to get as quickly through the theoretical overview as I can this morning. I know many of you are probably familiar with it because even if you haven't implemented this, you've got some folks in your clinics and your agencies that are starting to talk about this. And you may have had some water cooler conversations about what's going on with TCP. Uh, we know from our past experience running, I think, five other trainings uh, that followed exactly this format. Once we get into the afternoon, that's when a lot of the questions start to come out. And uh, we'll make sure that we save plenty of time for that. Still try to get you out of here right on time or maybe a minute early uh, is what we're looking at. Uh, I know that's part of the success of any training is that the presenter who gets you out a minute early or at least on time gets a slightly higher rating than the person who drags it out a few minutes late and gets people looking at their watches. So uh, we will move through this. This is module one. We're going to talk about what person-centered practice is. What is family-driven care? And there's some discussion. It's certainly an important aspect of TCP. It originally came out of FNC work. Uh, parents, children, how do we let families drive the practice in a way that extends beyond the individual client we're serving? But we also think that there's application in the adult system. And I'll talk about a little bit about that in a few minutes. And then the integrated in, integration of both of those concepts into what we know as TCP and how that uniquely works in Santa Clara County. Any questions before I move on about anything that I've said or anything you heard from Zelia? I will pause occasionally and ask for those questions. And just a little sign language first. In my world, this means no. This means yes. And I love the feedback that I get from all of you because it lets me know if you actually understand something or if I'm getting blank stares, I think. One, either the Starbucks coffee that you had this morning hasn't quite kicked in, or maybe you're just not paying attention and then I'm gonna have to do something to get that back so that we can keep moving on. So we wanted to give you uh, a couple of definitions. Person-centered practice, many of you know this from wraparound, from systems of care, uh, models from all sorts of other things that we've implemented over the years. Uh, so th a lot of this is going to sound familiar to you. It's working with clients in an individualized way and empowering them to really take charge of their own service plan and their own process here in the mental health system. So it's continuing the move away from a practitioner driven model, a bit of the medical model where you come in, you tell the professional what your problem is, and they give you a prescription for how to fix it. You just take that prescription and implement it and everything is solved. We know that doesn't tend to work effectively in most situations with our clients. So the focus then is on empowering them and engaging them in the dialogue so that we really understand at a deeper level what they need and we help them be a part of any solutions that we create together. This is the SAMHSA definition of recovery. And as we move towards the wellness and recovery model, uh, and again, away from that medical and clinic-based approach, we know that it's a journey of healing and transformation for folks to be able to live a meaningful life in community. There's a former SAMHSA director who said, everybody wants a job, a date on the weekend, and meaningful connections with folks in the community. Something along those lines, right? Our folks don't come in saying, in most cases, I want to be med compliant, and I need to get 16 weeks of trauma-focused CBT to resolve my symptoms of having flashbacks and stomach trouble around a traumatic experience I had. They don't describe life in those terms, and yet we try to force what they're bringing to us into more of a rigid model 
and stick all of that stuff on paperwork and have them sign something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them because quite honestly, it's not been written in plain English all the time. So we want to move, or plain Spanish, or Vietnamese, or Tagalog, or uh, any of the other languages that we're serving our clients in here in Santa Clara County. So we, what we've done really in working closely with QI, working closely with state regulations, is we think we've found a better way to blend <coughs> regulatory requirements with something that's going to feel a whole lot more individualized and respectful of our clients' unique experiences. So that you don't have to say, this is what we're doing in practice with you, and now we've got this paperwork that has nothing to do with what we're doing in sessions, but you need to sign it anyway, because that's how I keep my job. Uh, there's still, of course, requirements to get paperwork done. We're going to talk about the ways to really do that, that, again, work with your clients' experiences, and are a little bit more comfortable for them. A lot of this comes out of a book that's called Treatment Planning for Person-Centered Care. It's by some folks who are working really closely with the California Institute of Mental Health. And uh, they've done some of the previous trainings. If you've met Percy Howard at any point in the year or two that he's been working with this county, uh, he's been one of the, the folks who's really helped us to implement this and worked with us on some of the early implementation challenges. Uh, so I, I want to talk about a minute about resiliency. This is another F and C uh, idea implemented heavily with our first five programs and our young children, even in the teens. We don't talk quite as much about resiliency in the adult programs. And as I say that, I do want to reemphasize one of the things that Zelia said when she introduced me. I got my start as a clinic manager working with often homeless, mentally ill, drug using adults in a criminal justice program. So I'm the FNC person here. Amanda is certainly gonna talk a lot more about her experience doing TCP with adults. But I've got a lot of that experience too. So as I moved over to juvenile hall and I've spent kind of the second part of my management career working with youths and families, I haven't lost the fact that I've got a really good grounding having worked with some of the most challenging adults in our system today, uh, some of the folks that then have moved on to the rest of your programs. And just as a show of hands, how many folks do we have from the adult system? Adult managers, providers. It looks like not quite half. And how many from the FNC first five division? Okay, yeah, so we're, we're pretty well split. I will certainly talk a lot about how we've done this in our FNC program, uh, but I do want you to know that as I talk about things that may sound a little bit more oriented towards FNC and my approach certainly comes off that way, we can both answer questions about how we know this gets implemented on the adult side as well. And these items cross over. Resiliency isn't just a family and children's thing. It's very heavily ingrained in the adult programs as well. We just don't talk about it as much. So, you know, we have a definition up here, and I'm not going to read that for you because you all have advanced degrees, and you can uh, do that for yourselves. But again, we're talking in youth programs. It's We often refer back to 40 developmental assets. There may be 41 now, I think. Someone can fact check me on that. Um, you know, but it's, it's all of the experiences, the strengths, the assets that you have, both personally and in your supportive community that allow you to bounce back from any sort of obstacles or challenges that you're facing. Uh, and we, that's something as, as TCP is a heavily strengths-based approach, and we're trying to take that viewpoint into all of our work, we want to look first for assets and for strengths as we're identifying obstacles as well. And we want to put all of this to use as we're developing transformational care plans with our clients. Uh, and these are all traits that are related to resiliency. I, I want to respect your experience as managers and, and uh, clinical supervisors in most cases and not go through too much detail about what resiliency means. Um, because I certainly think that you all have a good handle on that, but I want to bring that out and we want to talk about that 
And as we're going through, particularly in the afternoon, we'll be breaking out into groups and you'll be meeting with folks from your team, if you have some team members here, uh, from your agency or other folks who are managing in different places. And you'll be actually doing some examples of narrative summaries and treatment plans. And I want you to take this focus on resiliency, on strengths and assets that your, your clients bring. And I want you to put all of that strengths-based approach into the exercises that we're gonna be doing a little bit later. Make sense? Yes? No? I haven't had my caffeine <laughs> kick yet. Uh, so here, one thing that I'll note at the bottom while you're looking at it, we've got the web address for that TCP website that Zelia was mentioning earlier, sccmhd.org. And then the TCP page is under staff and contractor information. Um, I think about halfway down the page, you'll see something that says transformational care planning. And that link is stocked full of all sorts of resources for you as managers and supervisors. One of the things that comes up uh, as folks are being introduced to TCP is the question about, is this an evidence-based practice? Is this data-driven? We, we've been talking about that a lot over recent years. And what we tell folks is, yes, there is a very strong evidence base that this sort of approach works not just for some clients, but really for all of our clients in the mental health system. And, uh, you know, again, it's been incorporated into other models like wraparound uh, and a number of other ones that you all may be familiar with. It's not in the strict definition of SAMHSA evidence-based uh, practice that's gone through all of the steps that they've laid out. Uh, it's not that, but what we really see it as is an umbrella. It provides a theoretical framework for all of us that as we're implementing other evidence-based practices, you're doing MST, you're doing TFCBT, you're doing any of those other three-letter acronyms um, that come with our best practices, this is something that can be incorporated into that. And we know that if you're bringing this sort of approach to your clients, with, along with whatever other model you're using, this is going to keep you all pointed in the right direction and your clients are going to be able to navigate our system in a way that's more respectful of their experience. In addition to the evidence-based practices, many or all of the catchphrases that you've been hearing in recent years fit really well into this model and we can weave them in in a way that works uh, at a very high level. You know, it's evidence-based practice. We can incorporate peer-based services, community support. It's certainly culturally responsive. And we'll talk a little bit later about what we refer to in TCP as cultural humility and the importance of that and how that's different a bit than cultural competence as we know it. But there's definitely a strong cultural component that TCP can be implemented regardless of somebody's cultural identity or personal identity at any different level. Um, it's very consistent with all of our regulations at the state, federal level, local QI has been working very closely with us. Uh, so you will inevitably have questions about how do I bill for this? What category is this in? What is QI going to be looking for when I switch from doing this treatment plan to the new treatment plan? Do not have any sort of fear that uh, this is inconsistent in any way with those. It is going to take a little bit of a mindset shift in order to find new ways to meet those requirements. But we've been on the phone even as recently as this summer with the State Department of Healthcare Services <laughs> clarifying some of the minor points about how is this going to be consistent, where do we need to document certain things around medical necessity so that we can do TCP in a very client-centered way and not rack up disallowances when we get auditors coming in. Uh, so that is met, certainly. And then you can, as you can see up here, self-determination and choice, stages of change, motivational interviewing, every other full day-long, eight-hour training that you've been to, it's gonna work with this. And we've got folks that are already implementing all of that, those sorts of models, along with TCP. 
I'm going to skip through a, a couple of these next few slides, but uh, I, I do want to point out and, and reinforce for you all, TCP is very much a partnership between our clients, any family members that they have, any peer supports or natural supports that they have, uh, and anyone else that's significantly involved in their life. And we're creating a dialogue with them so that they can drive treatment forward. We're setting up a framework for them, and we're saying, how do you identify the challenges and the experiences that have led you to seeking mental health services? What are your ideas about how we as providers and as agencies can, can support you in moving forward? And then there's, along with that structure, we're also emphasizing for them that our goal is not to be involved with you forever and sometimes not even long term that we want to be able to provide you with some professional support but our expectation is also just like your primary care doctor might refer you to any other specialist you're going to go see them a few times you may see them ongoing for six months or for a year and they're going to work with you in their specialty but at some point you go back to your primary care doctor you go back home you go back to your own support system and you're gonna be equipped at that point based on the work you did with the expert, uh, with the specialist, to be able to manage your own health in a way that is gonna move you forward. Um, so we, we're moving more towards short-term care and come back then if you need to. Uh, but we want to create that sort of engagement with our clients. Uh, the family-driven model, again, this is where I'm going to get into it, and I may ruffle a little feathers with some of our adult providers. What we hear, and we've heard consistently in a year and a half or two years even of uh, doing some initial pilot testing and uh, running some of our first folks through TCP training, is we hear this whole family-driven thing is nice for kids. You don't understand my adult clients. They don't have families. These are folks that have nothing. They're living in a homeless encampment down in Guadalupe Riverbed. Uh, they're an older adult and all of their family has passed away. They moved from another part of the country and they don't really know anybody here. And what we say is, oh, they don't have family. You said they live in a homeless encampment. Is that right? Who else is in that homeless encampment with them? Well, you know, I think there are, you know, 15 or 20 people, but uh, they're really kind of a loner. So they don't get any support. How are they coming into the clinic? Well, you know, they ride the same bus every single day and they run into the same folks and they meet up with them and spend an hour talking to them at the bus stop. And then occasionally they do some other things together. They're smoking weed with somebody or, and as we start to talk about that, we realize that everybody has somebody sometimes that person is a professional care provider it's your board and care home operator and they're kind of the only person that can humor you at times and they get paid to deal with your stuff and nobody else in your home likes you but that's then a significant support person and I'm not trying to general generalize in any way but we know that there are some really some folks with really tough circumstances out there and some of you in this room are going to have your therapists and case managers coming to you saying, this works with 90% of my caseload, but what about this gal? Or what about this guy? I just don't understand how I'm supposed to engage this person in a dialogue about what they want out of treatment. I'm gonna punt at least half of those questions over to Amanda. <laughs> She's doing that work. She's got some of the same clients that you do. We have to engage significant support people in order to do the work the way we're emphasizing with TCP. We have to find family members. We've got some agencies out there that have done a great job here in our community saying, you know what? Our folks don't always come with families. We're gonna find the family that they've been disconnected from. Or we're gonna create family connections because we know that every human being desire some kind of social connection with other people and it's that social network in many cases that's going to provide the support we can't as we move towards transitioning them out of our services 
And even if we've got some folks that are going to be with us for two, three, five years, we still are gonna look for that sort of support from their natural community. Anybody wanna admit that they're not smoking what I'm selling at this point? Steve, you don't get it. Family-driven care really doesn't work. Okay, if those questions come up, feel free to bring them up. We've probably heard at least 90% of the questions you all will bring to us today from somebody else over the course of this last year as we've been implementing it. So don't be afraid of that. The last thing we would want is for you to go back to your clinics, start taking questions from your staff or your colleagues, and say, yeah, I kind of wondered about that myself, but I don't know. I'm not so sure this TCP thing is gonna work out quite as well as everybody's saying. There will be challenges, but we wanna give you the kind of support that you need to implement it. Uh, and this is what I've been talking about a bit already. Um, we have to be able to engage those sorts of folks. The engagement that, um, that we're looking for extends beyond the direct service level and engagement with our clients. I want to point out these last two bullet points. What we know from some of our most successful staff, managers, agencies in the Santa Clara County system is that many of you all are already engaging peers, consumers, family members in decisions about how you're going to fund <coughs> programs. Which programs are chronically over capacity and need more dollars put into them so that we can provide services at the right level? Which programs you know, are under capacity and we can pull some dollars away and do some other things with them? And then even evaluating our programs and determining how effective we are. What we hope to see down the road is that as you implement TCP, you're going to be bringing to us comments from consumers and from family members about how TCP worked for them. And we'll actually know we're on track with TCP if people come to us with feedback from family members and consumers that this didn't work as well as maybe we said initially. Because we want families and consumers engaged at the level that they're gonna help us continuously improve what we're doing. How many of you know right now your agency or clinic has some component where you're getting that sort of feedback from consumers, maybe at least a step beyond the consumer satisfaction survey we all fill out once or twice a year? I get one hand, and I know there are other people, because I know some of the agencies, and I know there are folks here who have that. Um, so one of the things that you might want to take back is the question to your own management team or your own group about how are we engaging families and consumers to improve our programs. That's certainly a component that we want to have. Amanda's gonna talk a bit uh, in the next module, which is on assessment, about seeing the consumer as the whole person and really taking into account physical, emotional, social, environmental, spiritual factors, you know, a whole combination of things so that we're not just treating one specific illness. We're not looking at what we've got on axis one and axis two of our five axis DSM-4 TR diagnosis. We're actually saying, this is the cultural context, this is the environmental context, this is everything that's going on. And while we certainly have to document medical necessity and we have to ask ourselves, why are we as mental health professionals, mental health specialists engaged with this family? We know that if all we do is flip open the book on how to treat depression, because that's what we've got on Axis One, we're gonna miss entirely what our clients really need. They don't need a pill and 50 minutes of your time a week. What they need is something that's gonna take into account who they are and engage with them in a way that moves them on. Uh, you see up here that therapeutic alliance that we talk a lot about. Scott Miller, uh, David Mee Lee has done a number of trainings here in our county. If we're not creating that sort of therapeutic alliance, we're not going to effectively serve uh, the folks in our system. Three con conditions 
for person-centered care to survive and to thrive in Santa Clara County. We know from evidence implementing this program in other counties, implementing other programs in other places, and even here, what you've got to do is you've got to have a, a training like this, and that's why you're all here. We're not going to throw TCP out to folks, 1,300 of you throughout our system, and just say, here's the book, go read it and do it and figure it out yourselves. Uh, so we certainly have put together this training and all of the curriculum. We know that there's going to be some administrative work. We've done a lot of that in the mental health department. We know we've got to continue to do some of that both in the department and with our community-based organizations because we have to be able to allocate staff and support resources. We have to be able to provide <coughs> coaching calls. We have to define for our direct service providers what kind of structure their day is gonna take on, what kind of clinical supervision and support they're going to need and will be able to get access to in order to do transformational care planning. So there are questions that we've already received about how does this work when you've got a caseload of 60 or more clients? This seems like a heck of a lot of work. I don't know that I can do TCP with that many clients all at the same time. We can do that. We will do that. We are doing, we that. Are doing that. And we'll talk to you about how to get that done. But it's going to take some creative thinking on all of our parts anytime we run into those challenges. Um, you know, who's going to do the narrative summary? Are we going to be having paraprofessional staff do that? Does it need to be co-signed? Are we going to restrict it to master's level clinicians? Uh, all of those sorts of administrative decisions uh, have been worked through in a number of clinics and agencies. They're continuing to get worked through and we'll certainly talk with you, particularly in the last half of the day, about how we're doing a lot of that. Uh, and the next piece is that you all need to be able to make the shift in your own minds the field of change management uh, that comes really more out of the business field says there are two things when anything new comes along there's the change which is actually the physical thing that happens and then there's the transition which is what our mind does with the fact that our world is different now and what we know is there are some folks who say I am not going to that training until my supervisor signs me up and tells me that I'm gonna be in trouble if I don't go and there are going to be supervisors that say, this is the same old stuff from 1980, rehashed and repackaged so someone can sell some consulting services to us. <laughs> Whatever that sort of skepticism or resistance might be, we know that it comes up for folks. And we certainly want to come together as a county to resolve those concerns and to be able to move forward. Again, it's at the point now, I think our psychiatrists were talking with our medical director recently all of our county psychiatry staff will be going through this training. And the comment to them was, 1,300 other providers in the mental health system here are doing this. You all as psychiatrists need to know about it. You need to understand why the treatment plans look different when you see them in the charts and what that means about how we're engaging with clients in a different way. Uh, so we'll, we've certainly created the change at this point and we're a year or two into that. We want to help you all with the transition as well. So uh, at any point today that you have questions for us, we certainly want to address those. And then we'll get you all the support and we'll make sure Zelia or someone here uh, gets you the information about ongoing coaching calls, specifically for folks doing clinical supervision. Um, so those are the things. Clients and families is that last piece. Because we can make a change on our end and we can even be happy about the change on our end, but until we effectively communicate that to our clients and the family members that we're serving, that change isn't really gonna take hold. So part of what we're gonna show you in just a little bit here is some video examples, not of people getting TCP perfectly, but of some of our earliest folks taking a stab at how do I explain to my clients and to our families the way that TCP has, is being implemented and the kind of process, the kind of experience now that folks will have as they move through our services. So that if there is any expectation that I wanna come in, I wanna tell you my problems, I wanna get a prescription from you, and then I wanna go home and do whatever you tell me to do, that's not, anybody have 
more than a handful of those clients tell me what to do and I'll do it and I'll come back next week and tell you about it. But what we do know is that certainly there's an expectation from some of our clients that they're gonna be here for a while, sometimes forever. We've got some folks who have been here in our system for what seems like forever. And we're saying, that's not really the way we're working anymore. We want you to get out there and in a lot of cases and try this on your own. You may always need medication to support you, and we're certainly going to do that, but how do we get you connected with a peer and family support system that's going to allow us really to be either in the background or to disappear entirely for stretches of time in your life? So we've got to make that help our families and clients make that transition as well. And we'll hopefully demonstrate and help you see how you can engage in that sort of dialogue with our clients and families. And then the last, uh, I think this is the final piece here, is around cultural inclusiveness. And we're not gonna lose any of that. Um, you know, certainly we have to uh, understand that folks are individuals and that we have to welcome that sort of diversity, individualized planning, meet families where they are, and then sometimes we actually have folks who will start off their work with us by saying, no, I don't have any family and I don't want any family. I've got to be here for whatever reason, uh, but I just need to show up, get what I need and go home. No, thank you. Don't want anybody involved in this process besides me. We'll talk about how we deal with that as well. This is really just demonstrating a little bit of the recovery oriented model that we're using in TCP versus the old traditional model, the medical model, if that's what you want to call it, that's really problem based. It's based on the focus from us as professionals asserting our experience and our uh, specialization here to tell folks what to do. And I've been through this. Again, a lot of those in the second column, those catch words that we all know we're supposed to be doing. And TCP is going to bring a framework for implementing all of that. And that's very much the wellness and recovery model. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point. I think I've done that for you here. And if we skip through a few of these slides, it will just allow you to get more out of the training that we have for you later today. Uh, again, the client's own goal has to be consistent with their culture and their personal preferences, and that's gonna vary across a number of different levels. 